we live in a world of communication. It is the defining feature of the modern age. Whether it is your favourite museum, sharing a video, or the online edition of your favourite broadsheet, or an internet forum, or social media, or a meme, it is all thanks to the modern communications network. You might be forgiven for believing that this network is dependent on satellites, but only 2 or 3% of telecommunications is sent via satellite. The majority is transmitted by terrestrial means, and much of it by submarine cables. The maintenance of these cables requires a special kind of ship, and so today we will look at the cable repair ship. The first cable ship was actually a steam tug called Goliath, which laid a telegraph cable across the English Channel in August 1850. This cable between St Margaret's Bay in England and Songat in France was not a success due to signal retardation. But another attempt a year later was made using a hulk called Blazer, towed by two tugs and led by HMS Fearless. In the early days, cable ships were only vessels refitted for cable laying, such as the ex-passenger steamer Great Eastern. The Great Eastern was particularly successful, laying the 1866 Transatlantic Cable and the 1870 Bombay to Aden Cable. But as demand for telegraphy grew, the need for a specialised cable ship became more and more apparent. The paddle steamer Monarch was the first ship to be permanently converted into a cable ship, but the first purpose-built cable ships were the Hooper in 1873 and the Faraday in 1874. As the decades went on, telegraph cables gave way to coaxial telephone cables. The advent of fibre optics has resulted in an explosion of submarine cables. More submarine cables have been laid since the arrival of fibre optics in the 1980s than all the telegraph and telephone cables of the previous century and a half combined. And so the cable ship remains at the forefront of modern telecommunications. So what is a cable ship? Well, it is an ocean-going vessel designed to lay and or repair submarine cables. The characteristics of a cable ship include a high degree of manoeuvrability, ensured by diesel electric engines, active rudders, variable pitch propellers, and the means for transverse thrust. Modern ships have computer controlled dynamic positioning systems. To help us explore what a cable repair ship is, we have this virtual mid 20th century cable repair ship based on the Edward Wilshaw and the Stanley Angwin, which some of us call the Chairman class. Cable repair ships tended to be smaller than cable layers. They also had bow sheaves. Cable repair ships have traditionally had only bow sheaves, whilst cable layers have often had bow and stern sheaves, and in modern times only stern sheaves for the actual laying of a cable. There are usually three bow sheaves fitted independent of one another and free running. They are mounted on the prow of the ship over the elegant clipper bows, which project the sheave far out ahead of the ship. There's usually a gantry equipped with lifting gear over the bow sheaves if the ship is repairing or laying rigid repeaters. It may also be the case that large buoys and grapnels are visible on the deck of the cable ship. Grapnels are particularly necessary if the ship is a cable repair ship, as it must drag one along the seafloor in order to hook and then pull up to the surface damaged cables. Once hauled out of the sea, the cable is buoyed so repairs and testing can be conducted. Inside the cable ship are cable tanks. A large part of the internal space of a cable ship is taken up with these storage holds. 
cable is stowed in large circular tanks with a bell mouth rising to the hatch of the tank and at the centre of each tank there is a conical access reaching up towards the bell mouth. This safeguards the coiled cable from collapsing in tangles in the centre. As the cable is paid into the tank, it is loaded from the outer edge and coiled in towards the centre, layer by layer, again and again. A framework called a crinoline, moved on the vertical plane, is fitted over the cable to prevent too much cable rising towards the bell mouth at any one time. Another feature of a cable ship is the dynamometer, located between the paying out gear and the bow and or stern sheaves, and fitted to monitor the strain on the cable itself while it is being picked up or paid out. Telecommunications cables are heavy and lowering them to the sea floor, a sea floor potentially two and a half miles or nearly four kilometers below the ship, puts a great deal of strain on them. Cables are effectively load bearing at this point, bearing their own considerable weight for hours on end as the ship runs slowly along the cable's proposed route. In the past, cables have snapped, resulting in costly retrievals of the severed ends. The paying out gear is a large winch, fitted with a large drum. The cable, whether being paid out or retrieved, is wound around the drum two or three times. If a cable is being paid out, the drum can be disconnected from the winch gearing and its descent controlled by way of hydraulic, mechanical or even electrical braking. Cable repair ships often had bases around the world from which to work. The Lady Denison Pender was based in Aden during the Second World War. The Fifth Retriever was based in Fiji. Hydrographic surveys were carried out along the route of the proposed cable to find any possible dangers to that cable. When the cable layer Mercury went to lay the Tortula to Bermuda cable, it was the cable repair ship Stanley Angwin that surveyed the route. Depth soundings were made using echo sounders. Traditionally, such soundings were made with lead lines. Samples of the seabed were taken up and water temperature measured. The heaviest and most armoured part of any telecommunications cable is that closest to shore where the most danger to the cable is found. Anchors, rocks, the full strength of storms and waves, sharks with a taste for cable, and interference by human activity are all more likely to happen close inshore. Invariably, the laying of the shore end of a cable was the job of the cable repair ship, unless the water was deep enough for the cable layer itself. Once the cable ship had manoeuvred into position, the cable was floated ashore using a series of buoys. The smaller cable ship would then move out to sea to rendezvous with the rest of the cable, so that the shore end cable could be spliced to the deep sea cable. These little cable repair ships were hard working vessels, and no less than during wartime. The Second World War saw cables being cut by each side and urgent repairs made. It was a deadly game, and it was played throughout the world. The Lady Denison Pender had an adventure off the coast of West Africa when, as part of a convoy, her crew experienced a U boat attack. The first cable enterprise had to make an epic voyage from the Caribbean to Singapore, alone, 
via Rio de Janeiro, Cape Town, and Mombasa, making a cable repair to the Zanzibar to Aden cable in stormy weather en route. The mirror had to contend with minefields and a close call from a German bomber, and the retriever was attacked whilst at anchor, strafed by machine gun fire and then bombed and sunk with the deaths of her captain and ten members of her crew. advent of modern cable vessels has resulted in the multi-purpose cable ship, and so the specialised cable repair ship and cable layer have been combined into one vessel. Not only that, but modern cables are now buried under the seafloor using ploughs to dig trenches, rather than the traditional practice of simply laying the cable on the seafloor. Locating and repairing faults are these days more likely to be carried out by submersibles or remotely operated vehicles. The basic principles remain the same though, and the importance of their work has increased with more and more cable laid for our modern online world. <laughs>